first, I, uh, I'd like to thank, thank the organizing committee for giving us this opportunity to tell and discuss something about dredging near coastal plant habitats. That's probably a more descriptive thing than you read on the, on the back, which is the uh, piyank. Uh, who of you knows who pi what piyank is? <laughs> so that's one or two that roughly know what it means. I'll, um, so I'll explain what it is, uh, what this session is about, uh, and what you can expect in the next hour from, from Piyank and from each other, because there's also a bit of discussion, actually 20 minutes of discussion, um, with you involved. And that is because we want to uh, uh, translate science into action. That's a bit what Piyank is about. Um, you all do a great science, and you try to translate it in, into science as well. Uh, and the users of the science are managers, for example, uh, but also dredging companies that uh, are working on capital dredging, maintenance dredging for harbors. Like you've seen this morning in, in Singapore, there's a lot of engineering work going on, and there's also a lot of uh, effects of that engineering on the environment. Um, and to dredge in a uh, responsible way, uh, you need that seagrass science to be translated in a practical manner so that dredging people can deal with it, but also the other way around. Um, so we'll try to shed some light on this uh, by briefly explaining what Piank is. Uh, we wrote, on behalf of Piank, uh, a guideline which is nearly finished, and I'm glad to see that uh, quite a lot of people from this public showed interest in, in reading the guideline uh, when it's there, so uh, we've not been working uh, for nothing. There is actually uh, a need for this guideline, uh, apparently. Um, we do this uh, after I've given an overview of this guideline. I'll introduce the panel to you. You saw the names on the first uh, slide, and I'm sure you, you know all of them, or almost all of them. And then first we have 20 minutes of panel discussion and 20 minutes discussion with questions from you, our uh, panel members can, can ask each other questions as well if they not agree. So I think we're going to have an interesting discussion uh, on some things. Um, and we'll, we'll try to wrap it up with the most important findings. Um, and if there are new things, we can incorporate it in the guideline because it's not fully finished yet. Uh, and we also uh, are considering to uh, give a summary of what we discuss here in uh, a magazine like Terra et Aqua, which is uh, read a lot by dredging people, so that the knowledge from this seagrass community is passed on to a very different community. Uh, they don't understand each other very well all the time, so the more information crosses those borders, the better it is, I would say. So Piank, finally, the answer to that question is the Permanent International Association of Navigational Congresses or in a more practical sense, it's the World Association for Waterboard Transport Infrastructure. And who are the people you find in there? Um, apart from usual uh, dredging companies, um, I don't have to mention their names, I guess. Uh, you find also um, a lot of port owners, for example. Um, so people who need that waterborne infrastructure. Um, the mission of, of Piang is, uh, to do that in a sort of responsible way. That text is a bit longer, but basically uh, they want to make sure that things are, good, are done in a good manner. Uh, it can be technically good if you talk about construction of cables or cranes or whatever, locks, uh, but it also involves the environment. And an example of that is, uh, is the front of the uh, guideline you see here. Uh, some of the people working on this guideline have also contributed to this one on coral reefs, uh, and it's being used quite a lot. Um, our experience is what, yeah, this guideline is really valued because it helps to understand dredgers, uh, what corals actually do and need, and how to deal with it. But it also understands people uh, that don't have a dredging background to sort of need, okay, so this is what I have to tell the dredging people to do something sensible. Uh, and apart from the technical advice, Piyank is also about training uh, young professionals, and not only in rich countries, but also in countries uh, where the training is really more needed 
than, uh, in, for example, the Netherlands where I'm from. Um, so what's in, in this guideline, I already men sort of mentioned the goal. Uh, we want to inform contractors, uh, authorities, and NGOs on relevant processes involved in dredging, because that, that's not so familiar to everyone. Uh, we'll discuss frameworks you can use for dredging projects, mitigation options, uh, choosing, so enabling to choose the best pra and practical solutions to combine this economic welfare or an economic necessity to the also a necessity of having healthy plant habitats. Um, and with plant, we're talking about plant habitats, it's not only seagrasses, uh, it's also mangroves, salt marshes, and kelps, because they're also valuable and you should see them more as a system. And many of the, the impacts are very similar. So we didn't want you just to write a, a seagrass guideline. It's a full coastal plant habitat guideline. Um, the contents of the guideline are sort of sim simply listed here. Uh, what are these habitats and species and why are they important? Uh, you all know, but the dredgers don't. Um, and what is the dredging port and waterway construction and why is that important? That's something uh, every dredger and port authority knows, but some of the dredging techniques uh, may be not be known to, uh, to all of you involved in seagrass. So what are potential impacts? Uh, and thereby we want to sort of provide a framework like, yeah, you, you don't have to start from scratch all the time. Uh, you can follow the check, with, oh, what are the potential impacts for my project and uh, how can I deal with them in a, in a practical way? Um, how can I monitor effectively um, and, and practically? Uh, and we all illustrate all this with uh, a couple of case studies, uh, examples of showing, ah, well, this project, this worked great, this didn't. Uh, and of course, yeah, it's just a guideline, it's about 100 pages, so not everything is there, but we hope to provide enough material uh, to get people interested, and there are a lot of references for, uh, for further reading for really in-depth material. So we think this is a good way of translating science into action. Um, these are the people working on the, on the present guideline uh, on a firmer, former meeting here in, uh, in Singapore a couple of years ago. We all looked a bit, uh, bit younger. Also, I think CT still looks pretty good. Uh, I got a bit older. Uh, and some of the members are already uh, retired. So, uh, um, so that's the, the present group. Uh, of course, well, this is a Piank working group. There have been similar initiatives like this. Uh, for example, uh, the WAMSI work, uh, Western Australia Marine Science Investigation, if I say it correctly. Institution, sorry. <laughs> uh, and of course, the Great Barrier Reefs, uh, we've heard a lot, quite a lot about. Um, I think those are the two main uh, dredging seagrass plant-related uh, initiatives that yielded a lot of basic information uh, and, and procedures. Uh, we might have missed a few, but we thought it was nice to discuss our experiences in, in putting this guideline together with some of the experience from, from WAMSI, from the Great Barrier Reef. So that's why we uh, invited a panel uh, to discuss this on uh, dredging near coastal plant habitats, focusing on seagrass in this case. And this panel consists of uh, Paul Erftemeyer, representing the, the Pion guideline here, Paul Lavery from the uh, Edith Cowan University of Western, in Western Australia, Rob Coles from the other end of Australia, uh, and George Fulsheim, who both has experience in Australia and in Singapore. So uh, it's not a worldwide exp uh, uh, cover, but pretty good, I would say. Um, so I, I'd like to welcome the panel to the, to the podium so that they can briefly introduce uh, who they actually are and, uh, and why they are here and what their experiences with seagrasses are. And we should have a microphone for you. <laughs> ah, there we are.
So, um, yeah, you had the microphone first, so uh, Paul, please go ahead. People do keep throwing microphones into my hand here. Um, okay, as Jasper indicated, I'm Paul Lavery. I'm from Indus Cow University in Perth, Western Australia. Um, I've been in, involved in dredging related research as it impacts seagrasses for, uh, for quite a long time now. Um, it, the, the involvement began not so much specifically with dredging but with trying to understand the tolerances of seagrasses to a range of different environmental stresses and a big one was white reduction and that was very much in the context of eutrophication. And so the, the government agency in Western Australia um, engaged us to do research on, on Posidonia. Catherine Collier did her PhD around that and as that research evolved um, it became apparent that there was a massive amount of dredging about to occur in Western Australia. I can't remember the exact number in terms of millions of cubic metres of soil that was going to be, you know, sediment that was going to be dug up and moved around, but the statistic I do remember is that if you put all that stuff into a one cubic metre box and laid the boxes side by side, they would go around the equator five and a half times. So that was a massive amount of sediment that was about to be thrown up into the waters of northwestern Australia and the EPA became very worried about that. Uh, through industry a lot of funding was put together to, to look at research on, uh, on those seagrasses and uh, that funded a program in the West Australian Marine Science Institution called WOMSI. Uh, WOMSI dredging science node had the, the mission of uh, undertaken research to improve the capacity of government and industry to predict and manage the impacts of dredging. And it was divided into nine themes, looking at different aspects of the environment, and one of those themes was primary producers. So uh, I worked with Catherine McMahon, Gary Kendrick, John Statton, um, who else? Uh, Simone Stridham, who is here. Um, and uh, we did research over about a four-year period uh, to try to meet that, that task. That research um, is summarised in a, in a little document that Wamsey has put out. Uh, Wamsey gave me a whole bunch of these to bring up here and I promptly left them on my kitchen table uh, last <laughs> Sunday morning. Uh, however, uh, it is here. Paul's got a copy and there is a, a website on the back if you want to go in where you can get the, the full reports of all of the research that's come out of that dredging science node. Thank you. Uh, just to add on that, I think what makes that uh, dredging science uh, note of the WAMSI research program special is that it was driven by a close collaboration between the scientists and the end users of the science, namely the EPA and, and other people in the industry who are a bit involved in. So the research was really targeted and focused on producing uh, outcome that would meet uh, the needs and to fill the knowledge gaps to be able to better manage dredging in WA. Okay, and, uh, I'm uh, Paul Erftemeyer, I think probably known by now, and I have worked uh, first of all on seagrass, did my PhD uh, in seagrass ecology and had, uh, therefore I have a scientific background. But then after that I've worked a lot in conservation for an NGO in uh, Southeast Asia and East Africa, development aid and so forth. And then uh, I have become more and more uh, engaged with industry as a consultant, industry and government all over the world. And a lot of my work is uh, related to dredging operations. And because I've worked on so many dredging projects in the Mediterranean, in the Arabian Gulf, in around Singapore and Southeast Asia and later in Australia. I have also been uh, invited in a number of specialist groups and working groups to help put together best practices for industry on uh, dredging in sensitive environments. So the focus of those working groups, two of which have been uh, co-chair with uh, Matt Jury, the one on coral reefs that was mentioned earlier, which came out in 2010, and this one which is on coastal plant communities sea grasses, mangroves, salt marsh, and uh, macroalgae. Um, the uh, focus there was really to help industry when we have to dredge in sensitive uh, environments 
uh, how do we go about it because we don't want to destroy everything but obviously ports and uh, dredging uh, sometimes uh, also needs to happen even in those uh, in the vicinity of those sensitive environments and so as part of that work I have also written some literature review articles really global reviews so I've scraped together every literature piece whether gray or, or scientific or otherwise that I could possibly find on dredging in coral reef environments or dredging in seagrass environments and I'm currently writing another one on mangrove environments so the impacts of dredging and port construction in such environments I looked at what's the experience over the last few decades and uh, what works what doesn't uh, what are the real impacts and what are the perceived impacts and how can we best manage to ensure proper uh, port infrastructure and access for uh, industrial uh, transport for ships uh, without killing all the seagrass and all the coral. Basically that's what I have done and that's what I'm still doing today and uh, that's my background. Yeah. Thanks Paul. Unlike Paul, my, my experience is very uh, narrowly defined to the Great Barrier Reef in the northern part of Australia and our research group at James Cook uh, the Trop Water Centre has been monitoring seagrass in every port in the Great Barrier Reef. Some of them going back nearly 20 years now, so we've had a long history in monitoring port activities, including dredging. Um, but recently there's been a much bigger focus on activities in port that's come from that problem of coral bleaching and the, uh, the general feeling we should reduce the stress on, on the coral Great Barrier Reef in ways we can. We can't do much about climate change, but we can certainly manage shipping and ports um, to the best of our abilities. So we've had some major projects uh, just recently, uh, subsequent to, there was a, a quite a large um, problem with fish disease in Gladstone Harbour and that focused our government on the big ports like Gladstone that uh, adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, in recent times the government said that they will not approve any new capital dredging programs. There's two sorts of uh, dredging, there's capital dredging where you're actually digging a new channel or a new place and there's maintenance dredging which is just about maintaining the existing channel. So for capital dredging they've said that the there's about three projects already approved, those will go ahead, but even those will have to dispose of sediment that's dredged on land. Um, there's pluses and minuses in that, that uh, attitude, but that's what they've decided to do. And they'll allow maintenance dredging to go on with, with offshore disposal as it has in the past. So a very big sea change, if you like, in government approach to managing ports, they've said effectively there will be no new ports developed um, with, uh, in the current future. They've also spent an enormous amount of money in places like Gladstone. Uh, Gladstone's about the fifth biggest coal port in the world, the big, certainly the biggest in Australia. And we spent millions over the last few years managing that port. So if you go onto the internet and look up the Gladstone Healthy Harbour Partnership, it's easily available, you'll find that um, we have seagrass projects, mango projects, fish health projects, water quality projects, we're looking at uh, anthropogenic projects, people's perception of the harbour. They're, they're spending a lot of money making sure that that port is adequately managed both for the environment and for the perceptions of the people who live there and for political reasons. So not, not just seagrass, not just mangoes, but a comprehensive project to look at every aspect of how that harbour is managed. It's a big port. It's also got power stations, nickel smelters and aluminium smelters there as well. So it's a, a big industrial area but managed very, very closely at the moment. And the outcome of that is actually a report card that's done every year. Um, it's supported by the Queensland and Commonwealth Government. So you can go onto the website and look at how all the information has been put together. There's scenario modelling there if you want to have a look um, to see how uh, integrated a project can be with a dredging program. Now there is still a major dredging program planned for that port. Uh, one of the few capital projects is still allowing a channel duplication. We, we have, in fact, had real-time monitoring for light in that port. So uh, Katie Chartrand from our group has developed light monitoring techniques so we know how much light the seagrass in that harbour needs to survive. And that's been real-time able to slow the dredging down or speed it up depending on how the light uh, regime for seagrass has gone. Um, they do look at offsets for those projects. So if seagrass or mangoes are going to be damaged, the government has a fixed formula for providing money for research or offsets the losses that may occur. Whether well, that's a good idea or a bad idea is something I don't want to do, deal with here, but that's how they approach it. Um, so, so a very integrated project. A lot of people watching what happens in ports. 
to some extent, the, some of the ports, particularly places like Townsville, have become actually some of the better mangrove and seagrass areas in the state because they're incredibly heavily managed and watched. They're places where everyone's keeping an eye on and making sure it's managed properly. Hi everyone, I'm George Fulsham from, uh, from DHI. So my role today is really to talk a bit more about the Singapore experiences. Um, I've worked in Singapore for about five, five years. Um, but yeah, I started off in Aus Australia, I studied at University of Western Australia under luminaries like Gary Kendrick over there and Guy Walker. Uh, I then spent some time at the fisheries department in Western Australia. Um, and the seagrass is quite critical there for fish habitats and that sort of thing, so the crab fisheries, prawn fisheries, that sort of thing. Uh, then I was at Department of Water for, for some time, so Kieran Kilminster uh, worked with quite closely. I was, I was looking more at water quality. Uh, then I spent some time in um, the Middle East, working a lot on dredging projects and desalination projects, um, and typically a lot of impacts on seagrass. Um, and then I finally ended up in Singapore. So for about five, the last five years, I've been working in Singapore. Um, and so I guess my role has been a sort of intermediary between science and, and the contractors and the government, NGOs. Uh, so trying to interpret the information and, and make good decisions. Uh, so I've got to know a lot of the dredging companies, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Chinese, uh, the Japanese, the Koreans, and more recently the Chinese are coming in in a big way. So trying to educate them and, and to make sure they do the right thing. And um, yeah, the, the, the three places I've worked, one thing that has been consistent is Holophila ovalis. It always seems to be wherever you go. Um, they also have dugong populations and then green turtle populations, so quite interesting. Um, there's, there's quite a big history in Singapore itself to, to dredging and reclamation. Uh, Malaysia took Singapore to the um, international courts around 2003-2004, so DHI came in and, and did a joint study and um, came up with some recommendations. Basically Malaysia were, co were concerned that uh, water quality was being affected and um, some issues with the prawn fisheries and even impacts to jetties. So DHI did a, a study, a joint study, and came up with some recommendations and flowing on from that uh, was um, a big push to do EIAs um, more professionally and then EMMPs. So this feedback MMP pr approach, which has been really strongly developed in Singapore, which uses spill budget control for dredging and um, uh, online sensors and um, hindcast modelling, all integrated to, to have some adaptive management so that you can control your impacts before they get too significant. Um, and so yeah, that, that led to the PIANC um, guideline, which uh, Singapore has really adopted for uh, dredging around coral reefs. So this is really the next, the next stage, is looking at seagrasses and some of the other benthic habitats. Okay, well thank you all for the, uh, the introduction. I really hope that sheds a light on who you are and why you are here. Um, we gave you a couple of questions, uh, so you could prepare yourself uh, for it. Um, Rob, to start with you, uh, the, the big question, or maybe something we all agree on, but uh, detecting dredging impacts is a major challenge. Or do you agree, or do you think it's actually fairly straightforward? Oh, I don't think it's straightforward. Um, it depends very much on the background knowledge you've got about the area. So uh, we, we've had some instances, instances in Queensland where uh, seagrass uh, populations have declined in ports, but because we're monitoring in so many different other places, we've been able to look and do a comparison with other sites so that typically we have had some big cyclones come through and they've affected the whole coast and people have said, oh look, the seagrass is doing really badly in Gladstone, but we've been able to say, well, it's also doing pretty badly everywhere else. So it's hard to blame a port um, when there's widespread losses. But because we have that wide range of sampling programs, we actually have that information so we can provide pretty good advice. Um, I have made a couple of points. So every port's different. Or they all respond in different ways. It's very difficult to compare one port with another if you've got you know, certain characteristics of a port. 
uh, they may be more affected by particularly climate change. So places like Gladstone don't have a big catchment and not a big agricultural hinterland. They're less affected by rainfall uh, directly than uh, by sediment, say, than so a port that's uh, in the wet tropics where there's big rivers coming in like the Burdekin. So uh, there's a little bit of problem there with, uh, with um, making an overall statement about what can happen. You know, each port's different. Each port, you have to have a look at the various uh, constraints of that port, whether they're muddy places or sandy places, what sort of water flows are coming in, how they're affected by weather. So it is possible to detect whether the change is from dredging or from natural events, but I think you have to have a good history in that port, maybe 10 or 15 years, and some reference sites elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yes? Make sense? I don't hear any objections uh, well, so far. Well, your hands if it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just add one thing? The challenge is often uh, that uh, dredging typically happens in, in shallow areas to make it deeper, right, to allow <laughs> ships to come in. Port environments have historically usually developed in estuarine, uh, sheltered uh, sort of riverine locations where it's typically shallow, but where there is also typically sensitive environments and sea grasses. But those areas are also very often, but not always, uh, highly variable naturally due to the rivers and the weather and the wave action and wind. And so detecting uh, a change in an environment that itself is changing all the time, that's what is a challenge. And there are ways around it, but it's, it's something worth remembering. It's not always so straightforward and not always easy. Yeah, so to, to summarize this a bit, uh, it's good to, uh, or it's really important to have a, a good series of uh, a good system understanding of what's actually happening without any big, before any big human interference comes along like a dredging. Does that summarize it? Um, okay, then I'd like to move on to the next question uh, for George. Uh, not all seagrass meadows are equal. Um, so do we need to treat them equal, protect them, give them the same level of, pr of protection for a species that can grow back quickly, or uh, do we have to protect the species like Posidonia even more than others? How do we deal with that? Yeah, so, I mean, again, we've got to, we've got to have good science behind it. We've got to really understand the system as best we can because um, a complex system potentially is, is what we would theoretically think is the, the critical one that we want to protect, but even a spa system uh, has functional values, so we don't want to discount it. Um, so yeah, we, it really comes down to you've got to look at a case-by-case -case basis and, and really um, establish a good baseline and, and um, use the science that you have to inform you, but um, you, you You've got to think about your genetics, your connectivity. Um, so yeah, really, I think every time you've got to look at it a bit differently and, and judge based on the science that you can pull together. So um, a bit related to that, um, do you think it's also uh, use, useful or wise to set Turbidity restrictions for areas that might have potential seagrass growth. Have you experienced that, or um, do you think that, yeah, that's maybe overly careful because there's no seagrass at the moment, so you could be able to dredge now, or for example, for for populations that that don't occur or you don't see them during part of the year, that might be a good window of opportunity for dredging because there's nothing to harm. Yeah. So this. There's a, an, an analogy to that is also dredging at night, and so the, the Forest City project across the border, they've it sort of appeared out of nowhere. They they every, every night they were dred, um, dumping materials, so um, partially so it wasn't so visible, but um, it is applied in in dredging is you know, seasonal effects, environmental windows. Um, or dredging at night to try and reduce the impacts. Hopefully most of the sediment has settled by the time that the morning comes. Um, 
they're part of your toolkit. Sometimes they're useful, but still you've got to know your system really well um, before you jump into it. Um, it's not just um, turbidity levels. You've got to think about, we call in modelling terms, a fluff layer. So you don't want to be dramatically changing your seabed conditions uh, for the longer term. So you really got to control what you're doing too. Thank you. I think uh, someone wants to add something to that. Yeah, I might, might just add every time. I really have a problem with this idea of, you know, one, one species is more valuable than another. And one of the very early experiences we had uh, with people working in this room was, was at a, uh, a place just south of Perth, um, Success Bank, where Carbon Cement, a, a company there, was dredging shell sand. And the approach taken there was to try to quantify the value of the seagrass meadows in that area and, and the value was defined by a, a list of ecosystem functions or services that were provided and, and, and what happened is one particular species, Amphibolus graffiti, I, you know, I ranked everything else. It had more biomass, it had primary production, it had epiphytes, it had all sorts of stuff going on. So its, its value was, was much higher than all the others. Um, thanks to Gary, we learned a little bit later on that if you want to keep um, Amphibolus graffitii, because of the dynamics of that, you, you absolutely have to have bare sand areas that as over decadal time scales you have changes going on, that, that those, those areas are available to allow those changes to occur and for that species to continue to exist in that area and the whole seagrass seascape to be there. So despite the fact that it had by a long way the absolute lowest value, these unvegetated bare sand areas, they're actually critical if you want to maintain this area. So I think you've, you've got to have that understanding of the system and take it into account. Obviously, I want to add something to it, Rob, as well. <laughs> this is a, a tricky question. Uh, but I've been faced with uh, advising dredging companies and dredging programs. And sometimes you need to make trade-offs and you need to weigh. And so if you have, a, let's say, a 2% cover Halophila meadow, which I could hardly call a meadow, by the way, but uh, even though it may function and serve certain values, uh, it, it could be sometimes a trade of do I uh, lose that one or do I lose a hectare of very dense Posidonia meadows with full of life. So that question sometimes comes in, uh, and obviously a lot of the ecosystem values of seagrass meadows uh, de depend to some extent uh, on the density, the shoot density and the biomass that's there. And so if it's very limited and if it's uh, a transient uh, ephemeral species that comes and goes all the time because nature also put, uh, tosses the sediment around very frequently in certain areas, uh, then you tossing some sediment around once uh, may result in a temporary loss of some malophila and before you know it's back again. And, I'm sure uh, Rob can mention a few examples where Halophila and Valis uh, uh, covers uh, dredged areas within a year or so, dredged spoiled disposal grounds and so forth. So I just wanted to bring that point <laughs> that not all seagrasses are equal and, and you need to uh, put that in perspective. But yeah, we obviously want to differ of, uh, in opinion sometimes <laughs> about these things. Okay, um, before you hand the microphone to Paul, I think you put this nicely in perspective, uh, especially given the limited time we have. Uh, there's a lot to talk about this, but we also have some other questions. Um, one is maybe a more technical one for the far away Paul. Um, sediment traps don't measure sedimentation. Uh, I can guess, well, you, you probably guess all the reasons why they're not. Um, so, are there any good type of sediment traps that do, so, do do something useful and practical? Could you elaborate a bit on that, please? Yeah, sediment traps have been the bane of our life. Um, ev everybody argues about what the hell the data that come out of them means. And, and for people in the audience, the, the biggest problem with sediment traps is that sediment can go in, but it doesn't come out again. Um, and, and so you, you often get uh, an estimate of, of the total deposition as opposed to the net deposition that would act on a site because of subsequent resuspension or whatever that goes on. And the design of them can actually sometimes increase the, that, that trapping. 
Um, so there's a lot of arguments about what, what goes on with them and, and, and can we get better, better techniques which will, will tell us about the, the net deposition and I suppose the, the, the technology seems to be moving towards um, uh, sensors which you can put in situ uh, which be basically measure the, the amount of light absorption um, and as sediment settles onto a, a plate with a, with a detector underneath the, the greater the amount of sediment settling, the more light is absorbed and you can get an estimate of, from the relationship between depth of sediment and amount of light absorption about the, the amount of sediment that's settling. Of course, for that to happen, you then have to wipe the sediment off. Once you've got 100% absorption, you're not getting any more information, so you have to wipe the sediment off periodically and allow it to continue to accumulate. So, so this is the sort of approach people are taking. Um, my feeling is that um, uh, they may be useful for telling you short-term net sediment accumulation in a system. Um, an interesting thing in the WAMSI program is, is that the people working on corals are very supportive of this type of technology. And their view is that, that corals can clear sediment. So the sediment comes down and, and after a while they'll clear it and then more sediment comes down. And these types of techniques are, are sort of mimicking that. You can see a deposition after a while and the fact that it wipes off isn't that big a problem. For seagrass, there's a different issue in that seagrasses don't wipe the sediments off. So you, you do actually want to know what, what the full deposition, net, net deposition over a period of time is. Um, and I'm not sure that, that well, these sensors at this point in time can't give you that. Um, so you, 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 you will get a, a nice short-term estimate, but you won't get a, a good longer-term net sediment deposition estimate coming down onto the meadow. So I, I think we just, obviously the technology need, just needs to work a bit more to develop on that stuff, and it's reasonably promising. Um, and while sediment traps are not ideal, the one thing they do tell you is, is what the, the grass sedimentation at a site might be. So it does at least give you some baseline reference point to start working with. They're not perfect, um, but they have their place in there. And I don't think we should ever be just using one or the other. If we've got multiple techniques, it'll give us more information. There's two small things to add, sorry about that. Uh, the, another downside of sediment traps, uh, if you want to use them in a dredging program, to inform the dredging that things are going a bit wrong and maybe you should start reducing or changing your approach is of course that it takes two weeks before you have one more measurement eh, or something like that. So there are some people who have tried to make a whole circle of them and every day you, you collect another one and they have more frequent points but that's going to be very expensive if you have to uh, mobilize a team to go out in the ocean to collect all those data. So those sensors have a, an advantage that they give instantaneous measurements yeah. frequently and there are ways to integrate them over time to a kind of yeah. estimate accumulation over time. Um, so the, the other thing I wanted to mention was that those new technologies that have been developed within WAMSI, the, the, these sensors with wipers as well as uh, the recent developments in USGS with the set pots. It's another sort of a petri disk type uh, open tray type se uh, sediment trap which does allow for resuspension. Uh, they have been uh, used side by side in the Great Barrier Reef for a, a number of weeks or months. Uh, again, comparing them against uh, the conventional sediment traps and they found that this conventional sediment traps that everybody has been using since time immemorial have uh, traditionally or consistently overestimated sedimentation rates by a factor 10 compared to both those independent other methods that have been developed. So that's a pretty significant and worrisome uh, thing to think about when you measure sedimentation. Okay, then um, that's a good conclusion then. Um, another apparently technical question for, uh, for Rob, um, but it might be not so technical after all. Uh, should we monitor light or turbidity? Uh, so is the monitoring of NTU, can it be sufficient as a proxy to prevent seagrass impacts from dredging? 
Um, uh, Jasper, so again, come back to the every port's different. Um, if you've got a port like uh, Gladstone with a five, six metre tide, then uh, measuring turbidity is po pointless. It's always turbid. Um, that turbidity changes very quickly depending on the tide. It's ra rather meaningless. And in that, that sort of tidal range, seagrass is getting enough light at the shoulders of the tide, regardless of how, how sediment the water is. So, Absolutely, going to a light-based monitoring, or, or I've heard, I'm sure you heard Peter Ralph talking about the uh, molecular tool kits to look at how plant stresses can be measured uh, is the way to go. I don't think anyone's really suggesting that uh, measuring turbidity is, is the best way to go. But for those of you who don't know, back in the old days, we used to stand on a, a cliff or on top of a hotel and, and monitor plumes. You know, just monitor the brown mark on the water, and if it got, if it was there for more than two hours, we could call the dredging in. Um, but that, that's a very primitive way of doing things. If you're asking about the health of seagrass, then it's really about um, are you smothering it or are you removing enough light that it can't uh, get through? And that, that then comes up to complex questions about senescent periods, whether you should be doing it during flowering seasons, um, all integ integrated with availability of dredges, um, weather conditions, flood conditions, the likely wind resuspension issues. In, in Queensland, it's always windy during the middle of the year. So you get a lot of resuspension. There's some arguments about avoiding those times of the year. Right back to the first point I made, which is every port's different, cigars are different. Um, you really do need to know the conditions and you tailor the dredging. Each part of it, the dredging itself, the disposal of sediment, what technique you use, whether you use cut of suction or whether you allow overflow. For those of you who are not in the dredging business, there's many different ways of doing it, from quick to highly expensive but very environmentally friendly. Uh, all has to be tailored with the cost in mind and the likely outcomes in mind. I think it's a whole science in itself, Jasper, I'm sure you know that. <laughs> um, and it's something that, uh, some of these questions are hard to answer, but I think we've moved on from measuring to bidding. I just want to give credit to Catherine Collier, who is here, and her team, who have uh, really worked that out very detailed study in the Queensland in the Great Barrier Reef about how much light energy a seagrass matter actually needs to survive and to remain healthy and uh, the flooding uh, event that uh, happened in 2012 I think or 11 it really uh, uh, came in uh, un not really planned but gave them the opportunity to uh, make all those calculations and work out great advice and reports that how you could use uh, light uh, energy and over a, a 24 per hour period over a number of days to to predict whether the seagrasses are going to survive or die and uh, that that could be adopted for dredging programs. Uh, I have been challenged and asked to see if something like that could be developed in other parts of the world in dredging programs and then you typically run into the problem that they're dealing with different species of seagrass and then we just don't know how much light they need. We kind of know the minimum light requirement of percent service irradiance but that's no good. So if it's talking about how much uh, par per, per square meter per day they need then we still don't have that sort of data and we don't even know if that varies from area to area. So, but okay, uh, thank idea. you, uh, Paul. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have to move on to, uh, to the next question and I think it's a nice follow-up question. Like uh, Orb says, it's, it's not that easy and everything is different. Uh, but of course, everyone is looking for early warning indicators. Uh, you want to know what's happening. Um, so, Paul, the, the faraway Paul, <laughs> um, most early warning indicators are maybe not that useful or not that practical. Could you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, in, in a very general sense, I, I would agree that alone by themselves, they're, they're probably not that practical. Um, you can run experiments and you can, by all means, you can show that there are lots of um, physiological level uh, early warning indicators that respond in an experimental situation quite nicely, so maximum ETR or, or uh, soluble carbohydrate content might respond quite quickly and, and tell you that the, in a predictable way to a, a dredging related stress. Um, the problem is that, that they respond to a whole bunch of other stuff as well, so trying to operationalize that in, in a field monitoring program becomes very difficult. They, they'll that they'll respond and, and you've then got to try to understand, well, what were they responding to? Um, was it the dredging or was there some other things going on as well and what's the time scale? And if you think of something like maximum ETR, um, where do you measure it in the, in the meadow? You know, um, one leaf and another leaf could have quite different, um, 
different values or, or characteristics. Um, given that what you're trying to do is to protect the seagrass, my, my preference would be that you, you're actually monitoring something about the value of the seagrass you want to maintain, which is its cover or its production or its biomass or, or something else. Um, having said that, Peter Ralph's talk the other day really uh, that there's a whole bunch of stuff there that, that I hadn't even considered until listening to that and, and, and I don't want to comment on that but, but maybe later Peter you could and, and it's a pity that Mike Rashid is not here but Peter you might know whether how he's gone and been able to operationalize that in Queensland using the sorts of things you were talking about the other day or Rob could in a minute. The final thing I just want to say is that I, there's this push to get these early warning indicators. While, while it may not be a really useful single monitoring variable. What you're trying to do is not only protect the seagrass but to understand why you've affected the seagrass and so I think any monitoring program should have multiple variables in it so you can unravel the cause effect pathway and therefore you may still want to include these early warning indicators because they will tell you that the ultimate effect on seagrass was due to a dredging related impact as opposed to somebody coming along with an anchor and dragging your seagrass out. Um, and having multiple indicators along the cause effect pathway will reveal that to you. So I think they've got a role there. Yeah, uh, related, to, I, I think uh, from a bit of a practical point, um, you, you're getting a, a lot of information. And, and as a scientist, you, you love all the information. But if you're on the bridge of a, a dredging vessel and you have to run your, your project on time, uh, how are you going to deal with the information in, in, a, in a practical sense? Um, so that is more a question for the, for the other poll. How do you translate all these scientifically advanced measures into something practically be useful? So just, I'll just follow up that molecular toolkit. Um, I am standing in for Michael Rashid. He'll be much better to answer these than me. But We've moved from turbidity monitoring through to real-time light and we're now looking at um, the early warning um, molecular toolkit, the changes in the actual plant physiology at a molecular level as an early warning. To, to what extent that's becoming maybe too precise for what we need for a dredge monitoring program is for other people to judge. But it's very, very important that if we do call a halt to dredging because of the predicted damage to seagrass that we're absolutely able to justify what we're doing scientifically. Maybe the, the amount of light, six miles per square metre per day, or it may be changes in the physiology of the plant, but you could end up in a court very quickly if you weren't able to um, really, really seriously justify your decision to hold a million dollar dredging project in a big port. Uh, where lots of people have got money involved in investments and I really want to make sure you've got it right. So there's both a scientific imperative and a goodwill imperative in the dredging community to understand what you're saying, to listen to it, to believe you and to make actions uh, to slow dredging down or speed it up or make it or do it in a different way. If, uh, believe me, it's a difficult place to stand if you're the one saying stop dredging. Thanks. I realise it's a, been a long day, many people are getting tired, but uh, just to follow on the question that I, I was asked is, uh, has to do with the uh, the fact that scientists uh, are very good at doing the science but are not necessarily very good at translating that science into action in a realistic and a practical way. That's, I think, where the background of this question came from. And uh, sometimes it's even worse, uh, without mentioning names or without meaning it very negatively, but in the Great Barrier Reef region we have recently seen a lot of scientists becoming opinionated and that is I think really dangerous no. and it's very easy <laughs> it's very easy in a case in a, in a situation like when you're talking about dredging it's very easy as a biologist to kind of become biased and sort of become opinionated and, and, and not no longer be independently assessing facts on a case-by-case -case basis but to have a sort of a, an anti-dredging approach uh, in your, the way you view things. And I think it's a very important for the industry if they want to avoid impacts, if they want to do the best job they can, to rely on fact-based objective assessments by specialists who are uh, practical. 
I'm paid for it, of course. Yeah. What's the average cost of bringing uh, th That varies enormously, but the larger scale uh, dredging programs in uh, WA of the last decade were are in the order of 30 to 50 million dollars or so. Sorry. Yes, of course. No, I totally agree. Um, I guess the, some examples of where the scientists uh, that are working on dredging related sort of research sometimes go wrong because they lack the practical experience or they have not really gone into great detail in discussing and talking with people who are actually doing the dredging or who have worked on dredging projects before, is that you find a lot of research is done with a very unrealistic set of um, uh, turbidity levels or levels of the stress factor are really, really beyond the scale of anything you will ever see in a dredging program near a coral reef. And so then that gives the perception that uh, turbidity will kill all the coral, but that's at concentrations that are highly unlikely to ever occur during a dredging operation. Another example is uh, using sediment to look for the effects of, let's say, coral on uh, sedimentation on, on coral health and they then have been traditionally just using beach sand or something like that, which is never ever going to be the stuff that will be dredged usually. So it's important that you, you think very carefully and discuss with people working in the industry. And that's what I like about the WAMC research program, where you clearly see there's been a lot of in interaction between the dredging people and the, and, uh, the EPA and the, and the people that have experience in real-time dredging programs to make sure that the research is realistic, the research gives you the answers that you can work with, that you need to do a better job. Okay. Um, George, as a, as a last question to the, to the panel, I hope you have a couple of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> we started a bit later and I hope you're still patient and probably some of you still have questions as well. Um, we, we've heard quite an Australian perspective on things um, related to the, to the last remark. like. Um, people starting to be very conservative, uh, making, well, as a consequence, projects may not go ahead that otherwise might have gone ahead, or there's a lot of debate during a project. Can you add something to that on, with your, uh, also your uh, Middle East experience, for example? Mm. I mean, I, I, I agree with Rob that uh, you do get faced with these situations where you don't have a lot of science and you're You've got uh, big clients, Shell or um, some of the government agencies that really are driving their project hard. And so you, need, you can't just say, oh, we don't have the information. Um, you can't like over-engineer things based on no, no data. So um, yeah, you really, uh, you've got to be informed and, and sometimes you've got to push back and say we need more information before you, you sort of drive ahead. Um, so, I mean, there's one project that, um, I see Jeff from Empire, there's a bird crowd here, but um, there, was, uh, there was a boardwalk in, in Changi area that was going ahead and and so the plans went in and, and Park said, oh, we believe there's some seagrass in this area. You, you need to be a little bit careful with your plans. And so we went in and did some extra work, some baseline surveys, and uh, we found it was a, a calerpa species, an algae, rather than a seagrass. Um, but, but without that information, there was talk about realigning the boardwalk and changing everything around. So. Yeah, often you don't have enough information, but you've got to tr try hard to, to get it and, and push for more money to get it. Um, and in the absence of it, then you, you, you obviously rely on the precautionary principle and, and that sort of thing. But um, at some point, you've got to find the balance and, and you can't tell these very powerful, politically connected companies that they can't go ahead unless you've got a very sound basis for what you're saying. Okay, um, thank you all. Um, given the time, I won't ask you any further questions. Uh, I, I think the message we got, uh, it's, it's a pretty complicated field to work in, which is uh, challenging. Um, I can imagine some of you have some questions about problems you encountered or you're wondering about to, to the panel. So, uh, are there any questions, remarks?
Yes, oh, well, um, it's just a little bit beyond the dredging itself. I, I, uh, my question is, you have to dredge it. It's a project. It has a, a starting time and it has a finishing time. And beyond that, there is the, uh, the design of the project itself. But the design of the project itself has a time span that goes much beyond uh, the dredging project. Where does the monitoring of the dredging stops? Because, because of the design, potentially impacts could be much longer lasting. What would be your suggestion for that? I think it's something we don't do very well because, um, I mean, often with dredging, you've already done your capital dredging, so you've got a lot of information already. If you're doing a maintenance dredge, you can sort of go back in, in his, the records and, and there's already a lot of information available to you. Or um, say if there's a desalination plant um, that's potentially going to affect seagrass, there's already another four that have been built or are currently being built around Singapore. So there's already a, a wealth of information, but yeah, generally, um, because you've got a contractor in place and often they're paying for the work, it does stop once they, they finish their work. Sometimes then the operator may continue it on, but there's not necessary obligations for them to do it. So I think we are often losing out on a lot of information that could inform us for the future. Yeah. So uh, part of the WAMSI program, um, I was uh, in a very lucky situation where I got to work with some very intelligent and driven young individuals, the Kath McMahon being one and, um, and Paul Wu, Wu being the driver, and where we looked at risk using uh, Bayesian modelling and uh, we looked at risk in relation to environmental windows, actually building environmental windows in the dredging programs. And um, what, what worries me is not just the end, but also the beginning. How can we use the sorts of knowledge that we got from that work to inform the beginning of proce processes and procedures? And I think this, is, this question is really for you, Paul. Um, and uh, how can we... Uh, Make sure we're not just we've not just done another modelling exercise, and that actually is going to inform the procedures and processes of dredging globally. I hope I fully understand what really is your question, but I can yap a bit around it if you if I may. The the fact of I mean the the idea of environmental windows is just to say there might be certain times of the year that it is probably uh, potentially more harmful to the environment than other times of the year uh, and that could be because of spawning or because of the early life stages but it could also be the mid-summer uh, the hottest month of the year when the plants are really barely making it with their respiration versus their oxygen production so if then they don't get enough light they might not make it so there are various processes in the life cycle and in the um, dynamics of systems uh, when uh, the system that you're trying to protect could be more sensitive than other times of the year and uh, that could be uh, worthwhile to consider when you're planning a dredging operation not always do you have that uh, luxury to select the right time of the year because there are many other considerations that will uh, determine uh, when the dredging has to be done and uh, the consequences, they, they can be non-environmental particularly in the planning of the development of a $300 million uh, port or something. And there's quite a few other things involved, you'll be surprised. Uh, a few thousand people involved in the planning alone of, of such a development and the ordering of uh, <laughs> equipment and uh, spare parts and the flying in of the next uh, 500 uh, workers and so on. And so I, I have been involved in one project, just to give a practical example, that was a development in Darwin Harbour in Australia, and Impex was a Japanese oil company building a port. It was a large capital dredging program, and I uh, was given a task to help them to decide how are we going to be able to do this dredging without uh, uh, messing up the environment of Darwin Harbour. And 
the only way that I, as a biologist with some understanding of judging, the only way I could see it happen was to take a seasonal approach to the dredging, meaning to do all the dredging during the rainy season when the waters are very turbid and all the seagrass above ground biomass dies off, all the corals go in dormancy, all the fish disappear and all the tourists are gone and, and all the recreational fishermen will be uh, watching footy and not go out because it's crappy weather. That's when you do the dredging. And then when the weather turns calm and the, wet, the water becomes clear and all the tourists are arriving, you better get the hell out of there with all your dredging equipment and people and pipelines because that's a sensitive period, both for uh, tourism and for the environment. And uh, I thought that that was probably the best way to go about it. And then I was called upstairs and the CEOs of the two companies involved said, okay, you have two minutes to uh, explain to me why you think that's a good idea. And I did. And then they looked at each other and said, okay, let's do it. And then the next uh, day I was explained by my, the, the manager within the impacts that I was working with in the environmental department that that decision costed $20 million extra because they had to mobilize and remobilize and demobilize that whole dredging fleet with all its crew and all the pipelines and barges and ships away from Darwin to be used elsewhere in the world and then to remobilize it. And so I was totally shocked and I didn't even realize that the entire planning department had to start all over again from scratch because the whole development of the LNG development in Darwin Harbor was going to be put upside down because of my advice based on the environmental thing. So the consequences of your advice can be enormous and can have incredible uh, economic but also sometimes in additional environmental uh, consequences as well. Does that sort of answer your question? So environmental windows can be great, but they can have uh, significant consequences for the whole development and for the costs. And sometimes you can wonder whether 20 million bucks could have been spent uh, in a different way with more uh, environmental gains than what I advised. So I'm, I'm learning from it too. <laughs> so uh, I suppose the reason I got this back was, and I he I'm hearing, the way I'm hearing this is a lot of apology and what if and you know it's, we've got to do this that's what's that's what, how much it's going to cost but in reality if you build your environmental windows into your and your costing and your planning right up front rather than as you've done it as an environmental manager come in the come in the sideway and say hey guys you've got to consider this then the whole procedure would be a lot more cost efficient so it's, your argument can also be used against you and will be used against you so, you get, so to me, it's more like um, every time I hear these numbers, I just cringe because we're sitting down doing these sorts of research. We did this research with a million dollars across three separate organisations, and you're talking about $20 million. I know that the capital dredging associated with Gorgon, just the management of the environmental pro pro program was, what, $124 million? Um, we have to gain knowledge from these extra expensive activities to, and, and including things like environmental windows, to push dredging from what I perceive as a 1960s activity into the 21st century. Would be, and I'm not, I'm not talking conservation here, I'm saying it seems to me it's a very leaky, wasty procedure. How can we improve it for the environment? In our case, mostly people here are interested in seagrass. I think that's a very uh, nice and concluding uh, remark. Um, I guess uh, also given the time, and I, w I don't want to keep you from, uh, from the tea break until the next uh, session starts in about 15 minutes, um, I think that's exactly the aim of this guideline, to get all the experience or the experience as good as possible from seagrass scientists who know about when en environmental windows, etc., are useful to dredgers that like 10 years ago didn't even know environmental windows would exist. So I think that conversation between those groups is very important. I think the guideline is a nice way of getting that message across. Uh, of course, the guideline is not everything. It's just a piece of paper. It also needs to be told and discussed. Um, so I'd like to uh, sort of plug it again. Uh, well, I forgot to cheat. Um, so if you're interested in this guideline, it can be just as a, an information source. It could be also, and we'd really, really appreciate that as a, as a critical 
uh, positively critical or contribution critical reviewer, um, then please contact either me or Paul uh, or Matt Jury. Um, there is a, a poster on this where you can leave your name, but you can send me an email as well, which is just jasper.dijkstra at deltaris.nl. It's quite simple. Um, so thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your questions. If there are more questions, you can approach the panel or me during the, during the tea break and during the rest of this conference and workshop. Um, well, thanks again for uh, CT et al. to give us this opportunity to discuss this with you and thank the panel for, for being here and for giving us very uh, informative insights, I would say. And I'll see you.